night, veils come off. Turn that mic off, I'm sorry. When I start to declare, Father, I thank you, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. There's so many aspects, so much depth to that, so much authority in that. What we declared to you last week is in that place. I can say the veil, the veil of the old covenant, the veil of self-effort, the veil of try harder, do better, the veil of nobody loves me, the veil of I'm just a secondhand nothing, the veil of I wonder if things will ever get better. All those things can be changed. That veil of depression and disappointment is lifted in righteousness. And we'll explain a little bit more of that today. Here's been our scripture from Romans 5, 17. Let's put that up there, John. Romans 5 and 17, out of the King James, it says, For if by one man's offense, that's Adam, death reigned by the one, Adam, much more, everybody say much more. Much more. They which receive two things, abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, shall maybe get by on Sunday morning from 11 to 1. <laughs> or if you're a Baptist, from 10 to 12 shall reign in life yes. by one. So here's our three words, all with the letter P. And that is you have position. That's your righteousness. You're in the position to receive everything that was done from the finished work. And then you have provision, which is his grace. And then you have the person of Christ, which all of that is intertwined into because you're in him. You're in the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, Look at verse 21, if you would, too. Verse 21. Verse 21. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign. When people say, oh, grace just says you can get by with whatever, and it's just kind of a mamsy-pamsy passivity thing. No, grace is the tool by which you reign. Because grace is the tool of your oneness with Him, that you're receiving His ability when yours is not there. Even so, grace might reign through what? Through what? Through what? Wow. You reign through righteousness. Somebody's getting ready to pick up a joint, pick up some meth, get drunk. Right in that moment to look square in the face of your feelings, of your desires, of your temptations, and say, I'm the righteousness of God and Christ and every inch of my being, every molecule in this body is inhabited by His glory. So much better that than trying to say, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to try to quit that. Oh, bless God, I know I ought to do better. Folks, there's four things that people always say. We've, Jill and I have heard it in counseling for years. Put that on, on the screen if you would, John, those four things. Here's what we get with people that don't realize that by righteousness, by His rightness, His holiness, His ability in me, here's how you deal. Oh, that's a good one right there. I like that too. There's something about that hat making that just makes us want to reign, you know. <laughs> here's what we all say. I should do better. I should quit that stuff. I should have a better attitude. I should like my in-laws. I should get along with that boss who curses me. You know what? I, 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 just, I should have a better insight into life. I've heard that a thousand times. I've heard it once. And most people will see counseling as us trying to help you do better. Not true. And here's the next thing they'll say. Well, I know I can. I know I can quit that habit. I, I, I know I can, I can stop doing that. I know I can. Yeah. Then they come on up to the next level, gets a little bit better. I will, I will, I will. I will quit eating ding dongs. I will. <laughs> I've had my last honey bun. I've had it. No, I didn't say Kit Kat. Those are still under grace. <laughs> <laughs> they don't fit on this here at all. <laughs> you see, after all of our places of going under the law and all of our places of trying to change ourselves, which is impossible, you come to that last one. 
you start affirming an identity, a position. You start saying, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am. You notice every song we sang today, they're all declarations. I am more than a conqueror. I am victorious. I am inhabited by his glory. I am full of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness. I am one with him. I'm never separated from him. Now, look over where this righteousness thing came from in the Old Covenant. The name Jehovah Sidkenu, which means Jehovah our righteousness. Look over at Isaiah 45 and 24. Isaiah 45 and 24. So we want to learn today to start speaking into our unrighteousness, the righteousness. Now, before we read this scripture, back in the previous verse in 517 of Romans, it said, for by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they who receive. Let me tell you about that word receive. That word receive is in the present active participle. It's a present, right now, active, right now, participle. What's that mean? It means consistently, consciously acknowledging. If I have that receive in the present active participle, that means I'm always aware of it. I'm always declaring it. I always have it in front of me. So what he's saying there about the word receive, you receive the gift of righteousness. It's not a one-time deal. That doesn't mean that you get unrighteous, righteous, unrighteous, righteous. No, that's not it at all. You can't do anything bad enough to lose your righteousness. You can never do it because it was not given to you because you were good enough. But now the receiving is the day by day, hour by hour, speaking into every temptation, every challenge, every frustration, every depression, every argument, speaking into it. You will see today that righteousness speaks because the blood that gave you that righteousness speaks. Now here's where Jehovah Tzidkenu came from. Surely shall one, here we go, say... You got saved by saying. You confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart. You confessed that you and Jesus had become one. And so you confessed and said you were righteous. So here we are. Surely shall one say in the Lord, have I righteousness, Job Sidkenu, and strength. Even to him shall men come. I think that's neat, isn't it? And all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. That's a picture of favor, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. That's a picture of favor. When I start declaring my unrighteousness or my righteousness into an unrighteous circumstance, I believe that elicits favor. My oldest son works at Kia, and he came to me the other day and said uh, that uh, the manager on their line was really angry, and this was with dozens of guys, and uh, said, y'all got to pick up the speed on this thing. Y'all got to do it. Oh, what, what's, it's not Kia. Where's he work? Honey? Mobis. Yeah, right over there where, where Scott Curry works. Anyway, the guy on the line started cursing them. I mean, with language I could not use here. And just, you bunch of, y'all got to do better. Da, 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 da. And I said, Scott, don't react, respond. Don't react to the flesh. Don't give him what he gave you. You respond just the opposite in the spirit. When receive cursing, give blessing. And I told him this scripture. I said, when you declare you're not going to unrighteousness because you are, remember those four things? I should, I can, I will, no, I am. I'm not going to say, I should just keep my mouth shut. <laughs> no, in that moment you can say, I am as righteous as Christ. So now in that moment, he can claim that even when those men are incensed against him, he doesn't have to be ashamed. That doesn't mean he doesn't have to speed up the line and try harder and do better. Righteousness gives you strength also. I said, son, speak into that situation, your righteousness, and the incensed man, I believe, will show you favor. That's the power of righteousness. All right, now let's look at a couple places where righteousness speaks. 
Because I want to get that in your heart today and every part of your life to be able to speak that into it. You know what? Your life's talking to you all the time. It's trying to tell you, I'm sad, I'm glad, I'm mad, I'm upset, I'm frustrated, I'm disappointed. Oh, I'm okay today. And it's usually because of feelings, feelings that are elicited by circumstances. And we think that the circumstance elicits the feeling. I want to tell you something I wrote down yesterday. It just came into my head. Stop living life as it's something that happens to you. Don't live life like it's just always what's happening. No, it's like a cake you bake. There's ingredients what is happening to you, you don't deny it, but then you got to mix it and you got to cook it. You got to decide what you'll do with those ingredients. Will you speak into them or will you let them speak into you? Will you speak righteousness? Just like I told my son to do to that guy down in Mobus. Don't get mad at him. Don't blow up at him. Don't start cursing him back. Don't go with those guys after it and start that lousy. Does, yeah. No, because you are the righteousness of God in Christ and because righteousness speaks and the blood speaks, you can now speak into that circumstance and believe that the incensed man will become the favor man. The blood speaks. Now, you say, Pastor, why do you have to do that? Folks, our world is loaded with temptation. Our world is loaded with frustration. Have you ever seen a time in our lives that there's more anger? more bitterness, more angst than it is now. It can draw you in. I've never seen a, a society so angry in my 68 years on this planet as it is now, way more than it was in the Vietnam War. And I'll tell you what, we got to speak righteousness into it because there's a lot of incensed people. And you'll start judging, you'll start blaming, you'll start calling them this, that, and the other. And the next thing you know, you are a bitter, hard-hearted person. And then it's difficult to hear the voice of the Lord. Now, let's look at other places where the blood speaks. Look over at uh, Hebrews 11 and 4. Hebrews 11 and 4. We're talking just a little bit about good old Cain and Abel. 11, 4 of Hebrews in the King James. Now I want you to see how righteousness speaks. Praise God. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Now look at this next part. By which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Wow. God testifying of his gifts, that is his offering, and by it he being dead, here we go again, yet speaketh. Righteousness speaks. Will you let righteousness speak? Or will you let the circumstance speak? Will you let the argument with your spouse speak? Or will you let the righteousness in your heart speak? You have the choice. Now, why was Abel's offering accepted? Blood. There wasn't any blood in the ground with Cain when he was offering the fruit of the ground. Because what had happened to the ground? The ground was cursed. He was offering the fruit of the curse. Where Abel obviously had heard from the Lord. And he was offering a blood sacrifice. So why does it say that he was righteous? Blood, the blood of Jesus cleanses you, washes you. And not just one time, not just when you ask for forgiveness because you're already forgiven. You already have that righteousness by the blood. So the blood speaks. Now look at this other scripture. It goes right with it. Also Hebrews 12, 24. Hebrews 12 and 24. 24. Hebrews 12 and 24 says, I love this verse. Yes. 26, excuse me. Go on up one more, brother. There we go. Or 24. I can't, I can't see it from here. All right. My contact lens is, needs healing. All right. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, look at this, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. The blood speaks. The blood speaks. Get this, y'all. I love it when I get little confirmations about a message today about righteousness speaking, the blood speaking. A friend of mine that goes to the First Assembly of God over in LaGrange uh, sends this to me this morning. I screenshot it. And I have to read it to you because it really blessed me. Alex, read. 
Father, I accept and receive the testimony of the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, that speaks before your throne. He had no idea what I was going to be preaching today. That speaks before your throne in the court of heaven, declaring me righteousness without sin and holy, full of strength, and removing all legal rights that the enemy put on me through sin, fear, unbelief, and tried to infiltrate my life. Lee Chilton. This morning, 7.45 a.m., the blood speaks of our righteousness. Now, Abel's blood, why is that the blood of sprinkling is better than Abel? Abel's blood cried out for vengeance. Not that Abel was crying out for it, but his blood did. And here's the important point. Right after Abel's blood was spilt by Cain, the curse came immediately. The curse came. Now, even though the Lord spared Cain so many things and put a sign on his forehead and said, if anybody tries to mess with him, you have seven times more wrath than this. But you say, well, why is that God mean or something? There was no cross. There was no covenant at that point that could have covered that blood. But here's my point. As soon as the blood was shed, the curse came. Now get this. As soon as Jesus' blood was shed, the curse stopped. And the curse was taken off of you. And the sin was lifted from your life. And it spoke righteousness. What did Abel's blood speak? Vengeance. What did Jesus' blood speak? Righteousness, forgiveness, redemption, power, healing, blessing, favor. It spoke. See, folks, Jesus did a lot of miracles. Praise God. He opened blind eyes. He healed the leper. He raised the dead. He multiplied the loaves and the fishes. But you know, with every miracle that he did, that veil in that temple was still not rent. It was not until the blood, just like it was back in Egypt, it was not until the blood was on that doorpost. It was not until the blood of Jesus Christ was shed that that veil was open. And then we could come boldly before the throne of grace. Wow. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter the holiest place by the blood of Jesus. Wow. We have that by the blood. So what are we saying, folks? The blood speaks. So when you're praying the blood of Jesus over your situation, honey, it's going to speak. It's going to speak into your addiction. It's going to speak into your challenges. It's going to speak into your depression. It's going to speak into your heartache. It's going to speak in, you have an anxiety challenge. Now I want to tell you what, you can start declaring the blood and declaring the righteousness. You see, here's the thing, y'all. The curse that came on Cain was irreversible. It was irreversible. It was not reversed. But the curse that was put on Jesus now gives us the blessing that's irreversible. It cannot be reversed. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how bad you've been. I don't care how ornery you've been. And you see, now if you'll start speaking that blessing into your marriage, into your home, into your family, instead of just living life as what happens? My life's just, just what happens, just, just what occurs. No, you can speak life into it. You don't have to let it always speak to you. The argument that you and your spouse had, you don't have to let it speak to you and let it become an identity to you. Well, we just don't get along. Well, we just don't do this. No, speak into it. The blood speaks. Righteousness speaks. Now you take that and begin to speak life into it. It didn't come by good works, and you're not going to lose it by bad works. And don't define your righteousness by how you feel. Because how you feel is not an accurate indicator of it. Let me show you another place where righteousness speaks. Romans 10, verse 4. Romans 10, verse 4. I love this one verse. This is so powerful. This is my 10-4 scripture. 10-4. 10-4. <laughs> Here's my 10-4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. 
Oh, my. You see, that's what it told us back in, in the book of Jude, uh, verse 11, I think it says, where it says, don't go the way of Cain. See, Cain's name means acquired, gotten. I got it. Oh, bless God, I got it. I got it now. Man, I haven't smoked for three weeks. I got it now. I've acquired it all. Bless God. Did you do it by faith? Did you do it in saying, Lord, these are your fingers. I submitted to you as instruments of righteousness. Lord, these are your lips. These are your teeth. This is your tongue. This is your taste buds. I submit all of them to you. Those in pornography, Lord, I submit my eyes as instruments of righteousness unto holiness, and I speak the blood washing my eyes. I'm not going to open up that pornography again because now I'm not going to do it because I should, I can, I will. I now speak righteousness into that place. And now I don't have to be that because now I have a new I am because the blood speaks and righteousness speaks. Now look at this. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Next verse. For Moses described the righteousness which is of the law. Here it is. That the man which does those things, bless God, he'll live by them. If you do one thing wrong, you lost it all. But if you do one thing right, you got it all. I'll say that again if I can remember it. You see, what he's trying to say is that if you, under the law, miss one point, you're guilty of everything. But in Christianity, if you've made one right choice to receive Christ, then you're now innocent of everything. Folks, you're born from innocence. Now the key is by faith, you learn to live that out. Next verse. But the, watch this, y'all. Here we go. But the righteousness which is of faith, everybody say the next word. Speaks. Woo! It speaks. Your righteousness speaks. It speaks to your neighbor. It speaks to your mother in law. It speaks to your spouse. Because they see you not yielding to the flesh. They say, well, the blood speaks over their life. They don't get tied up with every type of the world's frustration. But the righteousness, which is of faith, speaks on this wise. Don't say in your heart, now let me just tell you this right quick. I know I've preached this before years ago. The Apostle Paul takes a scripture from Deuteronomy 30 and rewrites it. Right. He rewrites the scripture, you all. Because this scripture back in Deuteronomy had said, who shall ascend into heaven? And the next part is what he changed. In the Deuteronomy, I'm, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm pretty close to it. That is, to bring the law down from above. He comes in and says, who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Oh, that's his point. When righteousness speaks, I don't have to beg him. Oh, God, let my prayers just get through. Oh, I hope you'll hear me today. I just pray. No, see, righteous people already have a right that you are seated right next to him. So since righteousness has made you right, then you have the right to always have his attention because you're never separated from him, ever. So now I don't have to try to pull him down by my prayer. Now, see, that changes intercessory prayer. You don't have to have begging intercessory prayer. Now, they're demons. They want to rule. You bet. They're still out there. We have authority over them, but you better believe it. We have to impose that. So, hey, like the day uh, when uh, Debbie led the prayer about abortion. Hey, we got in some intercession. It was powerful. It was great. I believe it moved a lot of darkness away. But I want to tell you what. I don't ever have to think that until I really rev up the motors, until I really get that prayer going, that now he hears it. Oh, now he accepts it. I don't have to try to pull him down. The, the next part of that verse going on. Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up again from the dead. In other words, I don't have to try to do something to get God's attention. Good enough, holy enough, wise enough, good enough words. Hey, what if we treated each other that same way? Amen. Wow. I take all expectation off of you and accept you as righteous. Just like what Philip Shoemaker is not here today. He's sick. But just like what he said to his spouse. What a powerful word. So I don't have to try to convince God 
because the righteousness has already spoken. Go ahead to the next verse. Everybody read this with me. This is so good. When I taught at Ramah, this was our scripture. We had it up on walls. We had it everywhere because Brother Hagin's magazine was called the Word of Faith. So here it is. Everybody read it. Ready, read. But what saith it? The Word is nigh you, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the Word of Faith which we preach. I look at a normal day and realize I'm declaring all kind of stuff all the time. Why can't I come, since the blood already speaks, get in agreement with the blood of Jesus, get in agreement with the righteousness that the blood has given us, and begin to speak that into my boring day, my difficult day, like my son, my very intense, hard, ridiculing type of day. I can do it. I can do it under my breath. I can do it in my mind. I can declare it. I can speak in tongues and start to pray. Thank you, Father God, for your righteousness. Now start to speak in the Spirit. And I believe that demons are cleared out of the way. Remember the first Sunday I taught this, I showed you from Acts 13, where the enemy hates righteousness more than any other issue. Why? Because righteousness opens the door to every other spiritual gift from God. So when you stand in it, that's what Paul can say, honey, you declare your righteousness, you reign, you reign. Your place is to speak faith over that, not condemnation, not fear, not feeling as though you're a second-rate person, but that you by faith can declare the power of that righteousness. All right, now this brings us to the promises of God. How many of you, with the challenges you have in your life, not here to condemn you on this either, have promises that you're speaking over your family, sure. over your health. See, tons of you. I want to encourage you in that because you are declaring the righteous truth of God. Let's look at this one place. 2 Peter 1, we know this well. 2 Peter 1, verse 1, I've taught this so many times. There's some 5,000 promises in the Word of God. And now with cell phones, ladies and gentlemen, all I have to do is go to my little Holy Bible app of the many that I have, and the ones that Brother Jim has given to me. <laughs> and I can go on that app and I could put in any word that might be talking about the very challenge I have, and it'll fire up within 30 seconds a scripture that you could be standing on declaring that righteous word, same way you got saved, you can start declaring it over your situation. You know, we ought to utilize technology not so much just to all the time be watching our cell phone for everything else. How about we use it to allow the Word of God to speak to us? It'll speak to you. Do you have scriptures you're meditating on these days? Yeah. <laughs> You let them come down in your heart. All right, let's look over here. 2 Peter 1, Simon Peter, a bondservant, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Watch this right off the bat. To those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. What kind of faith did he had? His shadow healed the sick. He spoke to the lame man. He was sick. He was raised up. Look at the next thing. The faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. What opened the door for him to have that faith? I don't want just Peter's faith. He's talking about that's Jesus' faith. So how did he get it? What's the open door? What's the entrance into the stadium, which we call the kingdom? Righteousness. Wow. Next verse. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. Do you know grace and peace is multiplied to you? If you come back here and say, oh, I heard that before. All right, well, let it be multiplied to you. Because I don't care if you've heard the same thing 30 times. The Holy Spirit will multiply it, make it more practical. Fill this place. Fill that void. Fill this hurt. Fill this disappointment. Hallelujah. Grace and peace multiplied to you in the knowledge. Here's where we come back to the Word of God. Of God and of Jesus our Lord. Next verse. Now look at this, y'all. Seeing that His divine power. I love this has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. 
through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. Wow. There's not one thing that you can think about that's not covered by a promise. And you can declare that promise into that situation. The blood speaks, your righteousness speaks, and you declare that. Do you do that? Oh, I hope you do. I hope you do that in the morning, noon, and night. Instead of declaring, oh, I'm so upset about that situation. I'm just mad as I can be. I've had all I can take. I'm sick of this darn thing. You're, why declare all that mess when you can come back and let the blood speak over you, over them, over your church, over your pastor, over the finances, over everything? You have that speaking power of agreement. Now, please don't get this as, oh, he's up there preaching word and faith. No, I'm not. I'm not saying name it and claim it. I'm saying claim it and name it. In other words, I claim what's already mine, and he's already named me as righteous and holy and pure. Now I live out of that because he's given me all things that pertain unto life and godliness. I'm not going the way of Cain and acquired and gotten. No, I'm going the way of Abel. And that is, we bring the only offering that will ever change us. And that is the blood of Jesus Christ. So, he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who's called us by his own glory and excellence. Next verse. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. King James says great and precious promises. So that, look at this, y'all. So that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Now, that word doesn't get you into the divine nature. You're already there. You're already in the kingdom. It's just allowing you to partake. If I said, hey, we're having a meal over here. Brother uh, Jim will have that next week. Uh, we're having a meal over here. We'd like to have you come partake. You coming over doesn't prepare the meal. You're coming to a meal that's already prepared. I have two hammers at home. When Jill likes me to put many nails in our wall, Then I have two hammers that I can put them up. Why would I go back to Home Depot and get a third hammer? I already have two. Why would I have to go back and get more joy, more peace, more love? I already have them. Here's the truth I want to give you about this and the promises. People, ladies and gentlemen, here's the practical part of this. We see folks all the time that chase love. They're chasing after peace. They're chasing after acceptance. Somebody accept me. Somebody love me. They're chasing after success. They're chasing after fulfillment. They're chasing after happiness because they think they don't possess them. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your real inner man has all of that. So the promises of God let you partake in it how? They show you what's already in you. They're, they're not some genie. They're not some lamp that you rub. I confess the scripture 90 times. No, that's not it. It's showing you and renewing in your mind what you already have. People think that they don't possess them. You possess all of these by the blood and by the righteousness. That's what speaks. Now here's the question. Will you hear it? You are not separated today from peace, satisfaction, fulfillment, joy, self-discipline. I don't even like that word because it says I'm doing it. It's really God doing it through me. It's either feeling or faith. Which one will you choose? You are never separated from them. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the key to contentment. This is how you can be going through a hellish time. Because you're not ever separated from that. Yeah, your situation's tough. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, it's difficult. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely overwhelming. But you're in the middle of it. You can say with the Apostle Paul, it's a light affliction. But for a moment. Works a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Because when I speak the blood, I let the blood speak which cleanses me, the righteousness speak, which opens the door for me to all of the blessings of the new covenant. In that moment, I have peace. I don't care if I'm in a foxhole in the middle of a war. Amen. You are never, spirit, uh, never away from the presence of God. 
you know what? My spirit's not chasing anything today. I'll be real honest with you. As a pastor, I was trying for years to chase pastoral success. I was. And I felt lousy if I didn't have it. And I'll be even more honest with you. I can feel it now. If I'd come in here today and a whole section of folks been gone, I'd start going right back under just what we read in Romans 10. The law speaks, you didn't do good. You ain't saying nothing. You don't help anybody. Your prayers don't work. And see, all those things, when you start to see defeat in your life, in that place of defeat, you got laid off from a job, you've been told you have cancer, you've got some situation that's coming at you, in that time, you'll try to go back under the law and scrutinize all of it and say, well, I'm not blessed. So will you accept the circumstance or will you proclaim the great and precious promises? The blood speaks. Righteousness speaks. The word speaks. Will you declare it into your situation? See, this brings rest to your soul. I don't care if you've been promoted in your company or not. You're still the righteousness of God in Christ. You're as important to the Father as Jesus is. Now, do you let that speak into your life or... I didn't get promoted. Huh? I've had it. I'm sick and tired of being treated like this. I'm, I'm going to give somebody a piece of my mind if I still can find it. <laughs> I no longer have to go through these places of emotional turmoil if I let the righteousness speak into those circumstances. You don't have to fight with your spouse anymore. Righteousness will speak, not your hatred, not your bitterness, not what you don't have, not your lack. Boy, it's quiet in this Presbyterian church. Wow. <laughs> See, ladies and gentlemen, what we're doing is renewing our mind <laughs> and releasing. I'm working out my salvation with fear and trembling. I'm letting righteousness speak, not just the circumstance speak to me, not just the hurt, not just my feelings speak to me, and then I speak after it. You see, this is what Romans 12 is all about. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God. What's the mercies of God? All the grace, all the fullness of the finished work. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you submit your body as a living sacrifice. Remember what we said? Living sacrifice is an oxymoron. It's impossible to have a living sacrifice. A sacrifice is dead. What do you mean living sacrifice? You are the living sacrifice. You live with his death. His death has made you a living sacrifice. So you're Jesus walking. You're Jesus moving. You're Jesus talking. You're Jesus loving. You're Jesus breathing. Is he righteous? So are you. Is he blessed? So are you. Is he patient? So are you. It's just you speaking that in here and in here and out there. Amen. Which one will you believe? Whose report will you be? Leave. We shall believe the report of the Lord. Well, what's the next part of that verse? I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, you submit your body as a living sacrifice. Holy, H-O-L-Y, yes. So how does he, when you are submitting yourself to the Lord, what does he want you to think about yourself? I'm holy. Amen. What's the next one? Acceptable unto God. Thank you, Lord. I'm acceptable unto you. I'm holy unto you. Remember those four things? I should, I can, I will, I am. You start saying, my God, I'm acceptable. That guy down there at Mobus just gave me a piece of hell out of his mouth. But you know what? I'm going to speak righteousness into that situation. He let the fury come out on me. And I almost responded in kind, but I let the blood speak. It cleansed me of all that mess of bitterness. It cleansed me of all that hurt. It cleansed me of feeling like I was a worm. It cleansed me of thinking that I don't count to anybody. I'll let righteousness speak. Wow. So now you don't have to compare yourselves among yourselves, which is unwise. Why? You have the righteousness of God and you've escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. Hallelujah. When you find your spirit, you find God. When you find God, you find you. The two are inseparable. Hallelujah. Oh, I've got too many pages more of notes, and I'm going to have to crank it down here. The kingdom is not far from you. It's right there. 
It's right there for your taking, y'all. Please quit thinking you have to chase after these other things. You don't have to. I don't have to chase acceptance. I don't have to chase contentment. I just have to go to the second verse of Romans 12. Don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renewing your mind to what? The first verse, that I'm holy and acceptable unto God. And did you remember the last part of that verse? Which is your reasonable service. Your reasonable way of looking at yourself is holy and acceptable because that'll change your I am. Once you change the I am, it'll change what I do. And then it'll change what I see. And then it'll change what I relate. Antoine and I were talking about the confidence of King David. King David was able to take that rock, Antoine, and throw it into the face of that giant and hit him right in the right place because he believed who God said he was. So did he cower down in fear? Did he pull back? No. You see, in essence, remember what he did? He declared. Who do you think you are, you uncircumcised Philistine? What do you do in your circumstances? you let them talk to you? Or do you let the blood and righteousness speak and take the great and precious promises? Notice the last part of this verse. You escape the corruption that's in the world. That's righteousness, you all. Your righteousness can cause you to escape that corruption. So when it's coming at you, will you try to fight it with your dukes? Or will you come up with the dukes of hazard? <laughs> he took the hazard, didn't he? <laughs> So now you don't have to put up your dukes. Some other duke said, I'll take the hazard of hell and I'll absorb it and I'll win the victory over it. Now all you've got to do is come back the same way you got saved, the same way that David won the victory, the same way that the apostle talked about that righteousness speaks and let it speak into your circumstance. Stand up this morning.